Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mind Mate podcast. Hello, Paulie G. How are you, sir? Hi, Tommy T. <laughs> Tommy <Yeah>. T. My <laughs> last name's Tyrone. <laughs> Tommy Tyrone. Tommy Tyrone. <laughs> Do you know what? I've got this um, you know, I like I never had a um a nickname at school. And um you have one now with me. I got no exactly, yeah. Tommy Tyrone. I, I um I said that um to to Bill, a friend of mine. And um <laughs> he's like i was like mate i don't have a i don't have a nickname i really need a nickname this is back when we were crossfit coaching yeah comes in the next day and he's like um t-bone mm -hmm. and i'm like good <laughs> not bad bill thanks he's like t-bone and i'm like yes t-bone <laughs> is this my new nickname and he's like yeah and i'm like okay so why t-bone <laughs> and he goes <laughs> You know, T-bone steak. And I'm like, well, why is that money command? He goes, because you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> That's classic. You well and truly got me. <laughs> That's too much. That's great. I love that. Never stuck. <laughs> so what's, oh, the politics? what's the politics around providing your own nickname? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, it's, it's gross. <laughs> I mean, sometimes... Sometimes it's, it's look, if you don't have one just to, just to bolster myself here for a little bit, you know, I always felt a little left out, but I think, you know, for it to be a genuine nickname, it's got to be like, you know, someone said something funny and then it just stuck, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. You know? yeah, yeah. I think the politics is it's, you, you can't, you can't provide your own. It's a bit weird. But if you were to write your own, what would it be? Then it would be um, esophageal plasma. Okay, that's going to stick. Yeah. <laughs> OP, if you want. <laughs> OP could work. OP could work. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Uh, what would I give myself or what? I've been given plenty of nicknames. So yeah. Paul uh, G, Ian. Paul G is the one that has stuck the most for the longest time. Uh, and that came from actually a lyric back when we started playing uh, in Pablo Disco Bar and there was an actual lyric in one of our songs and uh, it was like an introduction to all these different uh, band members and the lyric for me was, Paulie G on the bass, he doesn't wear lace underwear but has a crazy mop of curly hair. <laughs> oh, that's good. But but we should, um, just for everyone listening and watching, we should probably clear that up. You, you do, in fact, wear lace underwear. Uh, well, back then I didn't. <laughs> oh, I see. It's I see. Now I, now I have a new nickname because of the lace underwear. Yeah, that's right. Which is Ian. <laughs> it's <a> fucking idiot. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. All right, guys. So we are going to, um, I'm going to have to watch this video at some other point, Paulie, but it looks horrible already from what I can see. For everyone listening and watching, Paulie sent me a video of, uh, what was it? It was you doing a loaded pigeon. So like the pigeon stretch, right? Yeah, loaded pigeon stretch at a at a very close mate's place, Duncan McDade. If you're out there, yes, I tip my hat to you. Um, and yeah, we were filming uh, like an instructional video on load uh, on mobility movements and uh, strength movements uh, combined. And I was doing a loaded pigeon, and he was at one end of the garage, and I was at the other. And I swear to God. On this video, you will hear the loudest pop over oh. base of, oh man, it's got to be 50, 10 meters or whatever it is. And you can just hear it crystal clear. It's just awful. I'm just hoping, like, I am going to get it scanned and uh, yep. get it. But I, I can load it up. I can, you know, walk, jump. Swollen? Um, actually, mm, it's not super swollen. Okay. So that's a, it, it's a bit sore, definitely yep. sore. But it's not super swollen, so that also gives me a glimmer of hope. Is it? Uh, can you extend it fully? Like, can you lock in? Yeah, hand? I can extend it fully. I can. Um, Wondering if it's meniscus, lateral. Like, there's so much loading on the lateral meniscus in that area. Yeah, look, I'm I'm, I'm just going to get it um, scanned just in case, and we shall see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I I'll, I will watch with bated breath, my friend. Because it looks, yes. uh, it already looks good, and I haven't even started the video, so I can't imagine if the trailer is this. Why don't you, why don't you turn the video on? Put All the right. put the right. uh, volume on as well, and let's just 
give the audience a view of your reaction. All right. All right. What I, I could even put this video into the show. So for everyone just listening, we can watch. Oh, yeah, you can do a picture in picture. Do a picture in picture. Yeah. All right. Let's let's have a listen here. I'll put it right close to the microphone. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Oh not good. my god. Ah, oh, that hurts. That hurts to hear it. It's like legit loud, right? Really loud. Yeah. It, I wonder, like, if everything's structurally sound, then was it maybe it'd just be like the biggest gaseous pop in the knee or something? Maybe that that pop went through my fucking brain. Right. Right. It was, it, I think it was. Someone asked me, and I, I think it was like four parts pain, six parts like shock. Yeah. yeah. Two parts Worcester to your sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. The shock is just like, so I can imagine like the rest of the video, you just pop, you're going bang, ow. Oh, you should see it. Oh. Like the, the, the rest of the video is hilarious, uh, kind of, because I'm getting up and I'm like, I'm not sure what's happened. I think <laughs> I'm okay. And then I go to sit down and, and then the uh, the bench that I go to sit down on fucking oh, really? collapses. So I collapse. It's like a Benny Hill uh, yeah, yeah. movie. Benny Hill or Peter Griffin just, ah, <laughs> ah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Polly. Well, let's uh, let's transition into um, into the topic of today, mm-hmm. with possibly the worst, um, most tangential digression segue of all time. Here, it's got nothing to do with all the bullshitting we've been talking about here. But um, we thought so for for long time listeners, and I know you're out there because you are beautiful, beautiful human beings, and and you reach out and um, and you say that you enjoy the show, which is a, a privilege. Um, you will know that Paulie and I um, transitioned and we created the Body Meets Mind podcast. And we did like 35 shows before we then consolidated back onto the Mind Mate show. But for a long time, what we were trying to do there was bring Paulie's experience as a life coach and, um, you know, what else would you do? Health and wellness coach, you know, various modalities for 20 plus years from the physiological perspective with my love of the cognitive. So body meets mind, okay? Bottom up approaches, top down approaches to holistic health and well-being. One of the topics that I don't even know, Paulie, if you and I um, ever did a show on this, um, but one of the topics we wanted to touch on and that we will now touch on today is depression. So not necessarily from a clinical perspective, clinical depression requires a diagnosis uh, with a mental health care practitioner um, and and certain forms of depression can lead to depression, um, which has a specific diagnosing criteria. But depression in the sort of, um, you know, the, the way that we would typically see it, right, Paulie, like, like leaning forward in the body, um, lack of hope, uh, despondency of the mind. Um, and then and then also, what we can do about that, both from the physiological, physiological perspective, and then the mental, but Is that how, that's kind of what we're thinking. Yeah, that sounds about spot on. You know, experiencing feel, uh, like for lack of a better word, like um, uh, experiencing melancholy, uh, downness, uh, um, you know, prolonged lethargy as a result. And we can talk about all that kind of stuff um, as we continue. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, that's a good good starting point. Let's actually start with the body then. So when you, I think this is what's so cool about working with people from a physical standpoint is that you get a, a really interesting access into the mental health, you know, yeah. by proxy. Um, so how do you typically see depression arising in the body? And, and what are some of the things that people say? Um, often it's not much. Uh, it, it's, it's actually a lot, lot less than um, if anxiety is at the surface uh, because anxiety, anxiety can be crippling, but uh and paralyzing but you know depression what i've experienced in my own personal um experience with um you know confidants friends uh clients um is is a lack of words um a lack of uh like like a lack of uh you know 
uh, vivaciousness and, and basically ambivalence at a lot of uh, things that are going on around them. And from a body perspective, you know, that, that, that access to being able to uh, express yourself and being able to go from point A to point B mm -hmm. and being able to say, I am um, going to the gym, I am going for a run because I know it's good for me. All, all of that just comes out of their mind. And uh, as a result of that, it just one day just kind of steps into the other. And then yeah. uh, sometimes it's an effort to even do your bed. It, I think one of the things that is really interesting there is that it's, it, it, it shows up in, in a lack of words, you know, um, and, you know, people might sort of say, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just tired, you know, or, you know, just, yeah, it's been a big day, but it's almost like you can feel that there's more to it, you know, that that's just the tip of the iceberg. And from a, from a coaching perspective, when, when, when people are working with you, when you're working with people, Paulie, and you know, they're, um, they have a specific set of goals they're trying to achieve, whether it's weight loss or, you know, building muscle or getting more flexible or perhaps like doing, being able to do some sort of thing gymnastically. Um, when they have disclosed depression or when you can just sort of see that something's different, how does that show up physically? It's the lack of tenacity, uh, the inability to want to keep trying uh, and, like let's say we're looking at expressing ourselves through through uh, a form of pull up or handstand or, or or balancing, you know, if it's the same person um, who is you know equipped with uh, a view that they are you know able to um, you know commit themselves to something and they are feeling fresh, they're feeling bright then that ability to keep on trying and be, uh, keep on pursuing um, a goal, let's call it a, a physical goal, um, their tenacity can maintain and their consistency can maintain. But I feel like, uh, you know, giving up or uh, just feeling like it's all too heavy and too hard um, can be a, a process. And then, yep. you know, the coaching challenge then becomes, how can we um, still get value out of a session? How can we still get value out of something, uh, but 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 act like a weed, move in a different direction? So then, what do you do? Because I think a lot of people who who are struggling with depression or you know it's anhedonia, low mood, you know what whatever it is, fall into what a lot of us fall into, which is that all or nothing mentality, that cognitive dissonance, where it's like, unless I go and have an amazing session then there's no point going anywhere. So what does that adaptation process look like? It's a case to case scenario, right? But uh, often the adaptation process will be, right, let's take a step back. Let's take a, a bit of a, let's take a bit of a break from whatever it is that we were doing. And let's change the environment maybe. Let's, if we were indoors, let's step outdoors and be exposed to natural sunlight. And let's give ourselves the opportunity to a change our, our outdoor environment and b change the action that we're actually um, stepping into. So if we were doing strength training, maybe a walk in sunlight um, would be a good idea. Maybe an opportunity for the person to decompress and talk about whatever it is, is on their mind could be a, a, a great opportunity for them to do it. Or maybe just to be, be, be walking in each other's company and just mm. get that, get that exposure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there are some certain, certain things that you really hit the nail on, at least what I see from a mental health perspective, which is uh, a loss of motivation, um, a general sense of worthlessness across all domains in, in, in one's life, you know, so, you know, I'm useless at my career. I'm a horrible parent. I'll never get this fitness goal. You know, everything I've always done that that real sort of um, catastrophizing. And I, and I don't mean that in a trivial way. I mean, like in a very legitimate, um, hard to deal with way, you know, and it's mm. different from grief because grief, grief and depression kind of look the same, but grief is very much, uh, localized on that yearning aspect of, of a life with someone who no longer is with us. Right. Whereas depression kind of looks the same, but it's this very ambiguous sense of, of worthlessness. And, I think that one of the things that's really challenging for a lot of people is that 
lack of motivation, that, that low motivation concept that, that even, and then I'll, I'll punch this back to you because you'd be able to speak to this better than I can, but, but even adapting the goal, you know, or doing something different feels like an overwhelming uh, hurdle or task, right? does um you know i've dealt with uh um, somebody in my life who has uh dealt with depression um and has peaked and troughed at various different times in their life and i've worked closely with them and uh, a few years ago um it really was about just being their alarm clock getting up and uh, saying now is the time for you to put your shoes on and get out of your apartment. Mm. Now is the time for you to come down to the gym. So once that, that happens over a series of weeks, um, and I'm only going to be speaking from the, the, the physical realm, yeah. okay? but you know, working even with different exercises, just getting uh, your right hemisphere, your left hemisphere uh, working and charging in the brain, you know, um, just just doing some self-journaling exercises, um, um, just doing some simple movement that uh, gets the oxygen pumping through your body. I mean, it sounds so... Um, it sounds so simple, but the ability to get the oxygen and the blood moving through your body, um, getting the endorphins moving, getting the dopamine shifting in in your body can have a significant, significant effect. Now, that's not perhaps solely going to be uh, the the vehicle that's going to um, push the needle, but like it's definitely going to have an effect. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think one of the things we have to remember is as human beings, we're always looking for the magic pill. You know, we're always looking for the reason why, and therefore the solution to yeah. problems, you know, and, and d- depression is ambiguous. Anxiety is multifaceted. You know, there's lots and lots of reasons and factors, but sometimes there is right. So, so maybe, maybe someone's uh, depression and again, not, not clinical depression guys, but someone's sense of depression. And because I'm creating that differentiation between clinical and non-clinical, we all have experienced what Paulie and I are speaking to here, those states of depressiveness, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, there are so many things that, that impact it. Maybe the root cause is the sleep, the sleep routine, right? So then getting up at the same, like what we learned um, with Deb, right? The, the biggest predictor of healthy sleep is waking up at the same time every day. And then obviously blue light and diet and, and all that sort of morning exercise, but the same time, for that alarm clock is, is the biggest thing, you know, maybe someone's depression is cognitive, you know, maybe, maybe it's um, the way that someone views themselves. Maybe it's environment, as you said, Paulie, you know, um, you know, would we, we would look at someone who is um, from a low socioeconomic background um, living in a really difficult area, struggling to make rent. Would we say that that depression is um, dysfunctional? Or would we say that is a normal adaptive response to a difficult situation? You know, mm-hmm. obviously it's it's the latter. There's one part, final point that I wanted to speak to here that um, you you raised before is that I think it's really important to bring your feelings into uh, how you factor what you need to do throughout the day. You know, I think a lot of us don't do that because we live in the the rat race where it's urgency culture, you know, and mm. the grind and we, we sort of glorify being busy in a weird sort of sense. Right. Yep. Um, which you and I could probably do a whole podcast on. It's like, it's, I, I can remember specifically many times that you and I've caught up for a coffee and spoken about that. Um, but I think it's about Ray, like setting the bar low to achieve something, you know, like to what you were talking about before, Paulie, like maybe, maybe the goal for the day is to put your shoes on and get outside Maybe mm-hmm. just sit out of sit up in bed for five minutes or something, just something. Just win, win every day. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head when you were saying we're so uh, obsessive about uh, ticking boxes. And I've fallen into these traps before as well. We're, we're obsessive about ticking boxes 
being uh, doing more things, being busier every day. Um, but but sometimes what we need to do is the actual opposite of that. Yeah, you know, we don't need to go to the gym. We don't need to do an intense CrossFit session. We need to actually just go for a walk in uh, and be bathed in sunshine for half an hour and maybe go for a swim in the ocean. Um, and, and that's it, you know, spend time with our families, spend time with our loved ones, because that will nourish us and love us uh, and, and fill our cups up so much more sometimes contextually um, than, you know, bumping the iron. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Paulie, do you, can you take us to moments in your life when you felt that sense of despair, that sense of hopelessness and, and sort of what was going on and, and what pulled you through? Um, look, uh, l- luckily for me, I haven't experienced a, a tremendous amount of times where I've been um, like really low. Um, but I do remember experiencing very early on in probably in my mid twenties, I remember experiencing, um, like crippling anxiety. Um, I was living off Chapel street and I just remember like, it was a, it was a, it was poignant because it was like a, like a, a, like it was an overwhelming panic attack where Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what to do and what to do with my body or my mind. And uh, what were the circumstances that, 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 that we're in? It was pretty much a divergence of careers. And um, I struggled to understand who I was identity wise, um, uh, you know, which path should I be taking? Um, and it was such a um, dizzying kind of experience that I, I was really like kind of completely disarmed and I didn't know um what, what the next step was. And I just fell into a, like a, like a stinking mess really. And, um, I think from that point, I just had that kind of, um, uh, lowness, so to speak, confusion, um, from that point kind of came the ability for me to kind of have the courage to pursue a path in, in fitness and training fully and wholly, um, where it was like this convergence of me feeling that the career path that I had studied, which is marketing and media communications, moving into advertising and marketing. Um, I felt a weight of expectation on me from those around me, whether they actually had that expectation of not was, was irrelevant because I was, I was feeling it. And I think it was like an identity crisis uh, not knowing um, who I was and what people would think of me if I pursued just being a personal trainer. Uh, but from that moment on, I, I really owned, uh, you know, uh, personal training and the health uh, profession. And I noticed a big shift in the way people kind of interacted uh, with me in a good way uh, uh, because there was a sense of pride that I took over um, when, when I looked into my career as well. Mm. <clears throat> you know, I appreciate that, man. And, and, you know, this is, this is what's really interesting about depression, right? Is that depression comes up in the animal kingdom, actually, when you see, mm. so for example, they've done studies on vervet monkeys, um, close ancestor, obviously. And when two dominant monkeys are fighting for status, and one of them loses, and then they fall down the status hierarchy and then end up on the peripheral, that vervet monkey um, experiences low motivation, anhedonia, which is loss of pleasure. Um, it can sometimes even rock back and forward. It, it hunches forward. Um, it, it's less social. The interesting thing is if you give it serotonin, it's puff, it pu- starts to puff its chest up. It starts to feel more dominant. It starts to become more social. It starts to work its way up the hierarchy again. Wow. What I think is really interesting about this sort of stuff is that we now live in a world where the hierarchy of a troop, (laughs) if we want to call ourselves sort of chimpanzees, is no longer 150 maximum. It's 8 billion because we're all interconnected on via the web, right? 
So when you're constant, so, and, and I think it, and on a, uh, another important aspect to this is whether we like it or not, we're always comparing ourselves to other people consciously and subconsciously. Uh, I wish it weren't the case sometimes, but we have evolved that way. So I think it's best just to sort of deal with the facts mm. and, and the more conscious you can become of it, the more uh, um, aware you can become as to how it's affecting you and influencing your behavior, right? Um, when you go through an identity crisis, and I've been through this myself, you, you, you feel as though the hierarchy that you're climbing up is no longer for you, Right. And then the crisis at where you are, where you are, is maybe at the top of the ladder. Maybe you're like towards the top of the the hierarchy or ladder. You're like, this isn't for me. And the pain and the panic that comes with that is, well, who am I now? Now mm. that I know I have to work all my way back down that hierarchy, figure out what the next ladder for me is to climb, and then climb up that other thing. Massive existential crisis from an evolutionary perspective comes with loss of self. Um, loss of connections because now you're climbing up a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to the vervet monkey at the bottom of a hierarchy. So there's a very important evolutionary reason as to why we go through depression. But I think what's really, really important is that when we feel depressed, and again, guys, non-clinical, Paulie and I are talking about here, <laughs> non-clinical. But when we do feel that sense of uh, despair and, you know, all the things you were speaking about, Paul, like, we could do our best to, to reflect and, and use that time like, like a, like a caterpillar going into a chrysalis, right? So that we can become a butterfly, which is an authentic version of ourselves. But I think that's the hard part to say. Yeah. I agree. And it's like uh, the, the time in which we need that the most, those tools is often the time where it's most challenging to actually put into place. Yes. Can you tell me? Can you tell me about a a, a challenging time that you've been through, uh, having uh, experienced um, non clinical depression? Yeah, definitely, man. Um, I mean, the big thing for me was when I got cut from the VFL. You know, I, I wanted to be an AFL player my whole life. Um, I became very, very addicted to the idea to the point where, you know, I'm actually just writing the the third edition of. Uh, rewriting the third edition of my first book so i didn't even know you made the vfl uh, i didn't i didn't i tried out for the vfl got it got it yeah 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 so i tried out for the um for the dolphins um, okay and yeah and i got cut after about sort of four weeks i think from memory um so yeah so i i wanted to be an afl player my whole life um um for our american listeners we get a, a fair few american listeners so the nfl equivalent sort of thing though probably not as fair to say on that bigger scale, because there's like, oh, we, we make as much, they make as much as the NFL. Players. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> High level. Uh, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but it's a big game, a big game in, in Australia. And, and it became so, uh, I became so enmeshed with the identity of being a football player that, you know, I can remember, and I'm just looking back on these diary entries. He's like, once I was an AFL player, well, then I would get all the girls and then I would have all the money and then life would be fantastic. You know, all the classic, um, issues that come with like putting success outside of yourself. And, you know, looking back, Paulie, like I, I wasn't good enough, you know, and I, I think I knew that deep down, you know, I just really, really wanted it. Um, I was a good senior footballer, um, but uh, I wasn't good enough. And as soon as I started um, uh, trying out, I was one of the fittest, you know, I, I got a 14-6 in my best beep test. Um, I was certainly up there. Um, oh. my, my skills were nowhere near like these guys, you know, like nowhere near. They were just... What position were you playing? Uh, ruck rover. So in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But these guys were just polished footballers. Really, really yeah. good. Yeah. 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 You Ooh. know, proper, proper footballers. And uh, I got cut and um, the, the, the coach said, um, not this year, but come back next year. You know, um, there's definitely an opportunity. I didn't hear that. You know, I just yeah. heard, you're not good enough cried my whole way home it was like an hour and a half drive home and and that began my existential crisis that was the sort of fall from what where i thought i was on the hierarchy you know down down to the bottom mm. latching onto crossfit because i was still attached to being some sort of athlete and then eventually falling in love with philosophy where i don't necessarily feel the that the hierarchy is much i mean it's impossible to get rid of it all you know but um 
that was a really, really hard time for me, you know, and that's when OCD became very prevalent. Hmm. Thanks for sharing, mate. It's, it's funny how, uh, when you're in it, you feel like there's no way out of it. Yeah. And looking back with perspective time, you can see, start to connect the dots. You can start to see the journey that took place. Yeah. Uh, it's like this happened for, in order for this to happen. Yes. It happened in order for this to happen. And now this is where I am. And I wouldn't be here if all of these dots didn't take place. Right. Right. Yeah. You, 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 it's so true, isn't it? it it's really hard. You, you just feel like you, it's like I've read studies where autobiographical memory shuts down. You know, there's strong correlations there. And it's almost like when you're in that place, you feel like you've just always been there. It's very hard for you to step outside yourself and go, no, well, this is why I got here. Now I'm in here. I could use this to think about what went wrong so that then when I climb my next hierarchy and make more of who I am, when I say hierarchy, guys, I don't mean dominance and success and all that sort of stuff. Like when I start doing my thing again, right? Point A to point B, um, that won't happen again because I'll be on a more authentic pursuit. But you're totally right, Paul. It's just when you're in that place, it's like, I've always been here. I'll never get out. And this is the best that life has to offer. Mm, mm. And it's a shit place to be. It's a dark place to be. Yep. But I feel like with, uh, you know, with experience and you talk about, you know, uh, going through challenging experiences and having that learning uh, mindset, either, you know, progressing or, or learning from it. It's so hard to employ something like that when you're in it. But I feel like in my own personal experience uh, as, as a youngster, I really struggled to um, implement that. But then with challenging experiences, after enough exposure to like God knows how many bloody uh, self-development books and uh, um, psychology uh, texts that I've uh, read through, I feel like, um, and I don't want to speak, you, you know, it's by, by no means an innate uh, part of who I am, but like, I feel like th th at least there's that capacity for me to in the guts of a challenging situation like that go, well, how can I, how can I grow from this? How am I going to be able to use this to be a better person, a better individual, a better partner, a better father, a better mate, anything, a better mate with myself? Yes, yes. Well, that's the big thing, isn't it? I mean, like one of the similarities that I, I recognize from, from both you and I is that we had this internal struggle of trying to continue to do what we thought other people wanted us to do and what we thought uh, we should do in order to be happy and be successful versus this calling within us to do what we really wanted to do, which we didn't really even know at the time. You know, it's like I'm on an island and it's sinking right now and I know I have to get off this thing, but I don't because it's safe and it was safe, but I don't know where the next island is. All I can see is just Pacific Ocean. Mm. So the scary thing is to just keep swimming. Hey Amen. No horizon that I can see. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So rather than sort of staying in the, in the depths <laughs> on the show, and, and if we could just give some of the listeners some, some tools, if they find themselves in that position, whether it be an existential crisis, a, a, a deep depression, or as Jim Carrey says, like a, a state of deep rest when you're depressed, you know, mm -hmm. um, what, what were some things that, that helped you in, in the beginning, Paulie? Um, Once again, I, I just feel like I just talked about before, it's when a challenging moment arises and it's so hard to implement this when you're, when you're in the eye of the storm, it's like, what am I, you know, six months from now, am I going to be feeling the same pain that I'm feeling right now? Am I going to be um, as broken as I am right now? And if you were to close your eyes six months from now and look back, having gone through six months of development and learnings, what have I learned from this? Hmm. Because the pain is never as vivid with time, but you also have the experience and uh, the, um, 
the knowledge of uh, learnings of six months that you can you can actually employ into your own life and become a more complete person. Right, right, yeah. So seeing it as a challenge, taking it one day as it comes, doing something. Doing yeah. something, look, like, that, that's possibly not, not, not a very, um, you know, practical uh, uh, set of uh, advice to be able to provide for somebody who's well and truly in it. Um, like if, if you were in it and you're uh, like dis, so disempowered, um, it really is what you just said then. It's just doing something. Yeah. Put your shoes on, do your bed, get out for a single walk during the day, call a mate or at least allow a mate to call you and pick up the phone, even though you don't want to, uh, you know, click uh, the little green button on that phone, but click it um, and just allow the process to take place. And it might take a really, really long time, uh, but everything kind of happens. It doesn't always happen in a linear fashion, but it happens. What about you, mate? Well, I think it's great to um, work off those points. I think doing something can come across as... Um, you know, forceful or blunt or, you know, even sort of patronizing at worst. It's it's not, I think for me, you know, I've obviously worked with people who were depressed before and, um, and, and even just in my, with my own experience, I think when you, when, when, when I say that, when I used to say to myself, I've just got to do something, you know, I've just got to get out of the bed or whatever it was, it, it felt forced and heavy. But if I looked at it from the opposite way, so I'm not, ne I'm not necessarily trying to make my day great today because I'm so far away from heaven that it's just impossible to even visualize. But I know that if I don't do certain things today, I could make this hell even worse. Mm. So what I'm going to try to do is keep myself above the red line so that this hell doesn't get any worse, which is at least I made my bed. You know, at least I called a friend. You know, at least I, sometimes it was that. I remember in 2014, when it was really bad, there was this show on Foxtel that was like these guys like um, who were excavating Greenland for diamonds. And I became addicted to that show. And I remember thinking at one point, like it's better just to like sit in front of the TV all day because at least I got out of bed, you know, <laughs> that kind of helped. Yeah. Um, so so when, when, we're not saying, you know, do something, come on, Jesus, you know, we're saying, doing a little bit is going to help you um, not necessarily get to he have heaven, you know, but, but make today just that little bit less worse. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also let people, and this can be really hard because there's probably a lot of shame yeah. uh, around the state that a lot of people are in, but letting people in that want to help you yeah. in some way, it doesn't need to be like a full on, you know, um, you know, live with them type of thing, okay. but um, just allowing your good friends and confidants to um, be available to contribute and be sounding boards for you if and when you need it. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I think it's normal. I think, I think I actually think, you know, long term, it's a healthy thing to really reflect on your life. And sometimes we're forced into those like, like you and I were, and I think a lot of people are, but I think <laughs> you don't really get to grasp authenticity without a, a true existential crisis or a, a peering into the abyss sort of thing. I do agree. Uh, one other thing I want to add to that is being able to actually express what it is that you're going through, being able to, uh, and, and I don't mean articulate it, being able to kind of identify it and claim it uh, and, and not label it per se, but being able to say, I'm going through this and I will get to the other side, but right now I need A, B and C. Yep. And being able to kind of articulate, or, or should I say, being able to communicate that puts it out there and it gives you the ability. Uh, and, and I think it's a really like, you know, I'm a father and being able to do that in front of your kids, mm. like 
to be able to do something like that in front of your kids. Like if you've just had a shitty day and you're yeah. like, you know, and your kids, you know, you come home from school, uh, from work and your kids are like, you okay, daddy. And maybe you're not okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're like, you know, I've had a, a, a really tough day. Uh, I just need to go for a walk around the block. But um, when I come back, I'd love to be able to play with you guys. Right. Right. Yeah. Normalizing it. Right. It's so important. I think one of the reasons why it's hard to deal with is because it isn't normalized. Yes. And it's awful. It's absolutely awful. You know, it's one of the beautiful things about our work, you know, coach and therapist is that we get to experience people without the facades and the personas, you know, and it's sad that we feel that we have to put those things on in, in normal society. You know, I, I can't stand that. It's uh, such a, uh, verbose masculine uh, masquerade that uh, we've been putting ourselves through for generations. Right. Right. Uh, Paulie. Well, on that, uh, on that, on that note, on that very real human note, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's always an honor to, to speak with you about these sorts of things. Um, it's been interesting Likewise. as well, hearing about it from the, from the physiological perspective too. Yeah, it's been a, a great chat. I, I didn't know exactly where it was going to uh, going to go. You're much from a clinical perspective. You're much more equipped to be able to talk about this. But uh, I can only offer my two cents as to um, what it looks like from a my own personal experience and b the the, the experience of uh, coaching people uh, from a physical perspective. So thanks for allowing me that uh, that moment to unpack. And your your insight was amazing. Yeah, no, no, you too, Paulie. And I think it can probably, it's more relatable that way as well. Sometimes you can get lost in intellectualizing things too much. Like what the hell's this bald dude with a beard saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, lots of love until next time. Bye for now. Bye-bye.